as women veterans. And so, uh, just to start off, my name is Lila Holly. I am an Army veteran. I served 22 years active duty in the Army, and so I've traveled around the world from my 22 year um, career. I'm originally from New York State, upstate, and um, I really enjoyed serving in the Army. Um, like I said, it afforded me a lot of opportunities. I was able to retire as a Chief Warrant Officer for. So um, that was that was pretty significant. So I'm going to tell you a little bit of my story, and then I'm going to just as you listen to my story, I'll give you kind of the short version because we're going to go into a panel discussion with published author, women veterans. Um, I'll give you the short version, but as you listen to it, think about your own story and how layered your story is, and the opportunities that you have in your life to tell your own story, right? Because the bottom line is, as women veterans, we don't we don't really stand out. I don't stand out with this hair, right? <laughs> you would never expect me to see me walking down the street and, it's, and assume that I'm a woman veteran, right? Unless I'm wearing my t-shirt or my pin or my hat, identifying myself as such. And even still, I hear women say, I got my woman veteran hat on. <laughs> and somebody still asks me, oh, did your husband serve? Yeah. <laughs> It says woman veteran, like, can you read? <laughs> how, how did you come to that conclusion? No, I'm the veteran, I served. And so I think for us, it's very important for us as women veterans to take ownership of our stories, to tell our stories. And so I'm gonna give you like three ways that you can tell your story. You don't have to be a published author, but there's ways that we can absolutely tell our story. So my story started in upstate New York. I became a mother at 15. Yes, I did. I had a child as a teenager. And so I really thought my opportunity to join the military was pretty much over when I had my son. But I went into high school and I joined junior ROTC and I loved it. I like really excelled at it. I really didn't know there was this leader living inside of me and she was just pretty incredible. And so the student, um, the student instructors noticed that in me, even the adult instructors noticed that. And so um, that kind of, you know, swelled up the the the, um, the the desire to join the military. But being a mother so young, I really didn't think I had the opportunity to do so. Um, so the first trip to the recruiter's office was to the Air Force recruiter. And he, he was like, oh, your scores are so good. Wow, we really wanna, you know, have this conversation with you. We think you'd be a great candidate. Until I opened my mouth and said I was a mother. He was like, uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, no, this is not gonna work, I'm sorry. We're, and our whole conversation changed and my whole, my whole demeanor was like in the toilet because I was like, wow, that just, that just went a different direction. And so I came out of the, <laughs> right, I came out of the Air Force recruiter's office like really defeated in my spirit. And who was there? That Army recruiter, right? <laughs> hey, come here, what they say to you, what they say to you? <laughs> He was like, he put his arm around me. What did he say? What did he say? He pulled up my scores and he was like, what? Yeah, come on, let's talk, let's talk. And so we had a conversation. He kind of walked me through the process. Um, I had to give my son to my parents and uh, they really supported me in my decision and I, and I never looked back. Um, it was something that I felt like I had to do to change the dynamics and the direction of my situation. I really did. So I joined the military in 1990. Um, fresh off the block, y'all, just fresh off the block. A lot of street in me, just a lot going on. Um, but I loved it, and uh, I opened myself up to learn, to be disciplined, <laughs> all of that. And so, um, as I went throughout my career, um, I made rank, I learned a lot of lessons, and then I met my wonderful husband, right? So I'm transitioning to transition, made up to the rank of E6, and I transitioned to warrant officer, and I met my wonderful husband. Um, we married to, uh, I was single mother for 10 years in the military, and then I was dual military. So those of you who, how many of y'all have served dual military? Yeah, it's tough, right? It's tough. Like, it's tough. Can you give me tissue out of my bag? Actually, it's tough. So, um, it, it was, it was really tough because the first three years of us being married, like, I met my soldier and I was so in love. I didn't marry him to be separated from him for three years. Thanks to Uncle Sam, we lived in two separate states for three years, our first three years of marriage. 
Thank God we survived. And next year we'll be celebrating 20 years married, right? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. I'm so excited. My husband is, he's the best. I love him. And he's my best friend and my biggest supporter. So, so uh, dual military. So our first five years of marriage, we probably lived together nine months. Really, literally nine. So the first three years we were in two different states and we finally got together and we were like, oh, we're so in love. And then we find out that our unit is deploying, right? So he ships off for deployment. I got like five days before I'm supposed to get on the airplane to deploy. And you know how they rally all the ladies down for that last pregnancy test? So they're handing out everybody's not pregnant, not pregnant, not pregnant. They're like, chief, stand over here to the side. Not pregnant, I'm not like, <laughs> My husband's like, why is it not working? I'm like, because we get together once every three months. Like, it, don't, it, it ain't just, it, it's not magic. It's not going to happen. So he deployed. I find out five days before I was supposed to ship out that I'm pregnant with our daughter. And I um, had to send a message down range to let him know that I would not be joining him in Iraq. <laughs> and, uh, he was so sad about that. No, not really. But um, so that, that's a whole nother year of separation, right? And so he finally comes home. Jada's born. And um, in her two week screening, we find out, we discover that she has sickle cell disease, right? So that's, that puts our family in a different category. So now we're an e, e, uh, exceptional family member in the exceptional family member program, EFMP program. And so um, that just means we have to be educated on how to care for our daughter. And that's, and that's exactly what the military did. That's what exactly what the doctors did, helped us and educated us on what that meant and how we were to care for her. <coughs> All right, and so now, um, I'm, now we fast forward probably about six months. I get promoted to uh, CW3 and I'm so excited. And now I get orders to deploy. And so then we're going into our fifth year of marriage. Now I'm deploying. My daughter turns <coughs> one and I'm deploying. And Man, that day almost broke me in half, y'all. I was on an airplane snotting and crying and carrying on. The stewardess was like, do you want a drink? I was like, no, I'm in uniform. I wish I could, but I can't. But um, I survived it. And um, so that took us five years in the same residence with my husband, probably nine months in that five-year period. And so after deployment, while I was deployed, my husband retired from the military. So that left me as the sole military member in the family, right? So, so many different dynamics to this story, right? So the last five years of my military career, I moved my family four times. Yeah, five years, four times. And so I said my husband, I mean, he wouldn't have stuck around for 20 years if he wasn't great. Like, he was great during his time. He really supported me. Um, it was just things happening in my career because um, I was a CW4 at this time. I got, just got promoted and um, he really supported me. And I mean, it, it didn't, it, it, the bonus was that we lived in Hawaii three years <laughs> and then we had to move four times after that. So, um, and then transition came. Uh, it, it, was, it was after I hit 22 years and I was like, man, this, I'm done, I'm tired. It's, it's a wrap, so I'm done. Um, Playing to retire, and I had given all that I could give to the military, it, and I felt like I was done. And so transition comes, and so like everything else in my career, I, I did it with a can-do attitude, I charge hard, like the chief does, and then all of a sudden, I go through transition, and I hit a brick wall. A brick wall. How many of y'all know that brick wall? <laughs> Absolutely, I hit a brick wall. And so, it really caught me off guard, because I wasn't expecting that. How many of y'all was expecting that? Like, who got the heads up? Like I, I, I was like, man, I wish somebody would have freaking gave me the heads up. Then I would have known, right? You know? But I mean, it, it really caught me off guard. The emotional process of leaving the military and re identifying ourselves. Like, I figured out who I was, getting in contact and, and getting to know Lila all over again. It was tough. And so it really caught me off guard. So I took to journaling at that time because um, I forgot, to, I skipped this in my story in the military so because of that all that stretch between living separated and deployments and we we try to have another child 
And so we went through IVF um, and we ended up pregnant with twin girls. Oh, oh nice. Did. We did, we did. And it was wonderful, it was a great experience. We were so happy. At 22 weeks, I went into full-blown labor with the girls and um, they didn't survive. Um, but it was, it was a very dark, devastating period in my life. And I will tell you that I took the journaling during that time as well to process those emotions. And so when I transitioned, I, real, I remembered what, what journaling did for me. And so I, went, I reverted back to journaling when I transitioned and I found myself in a dark place again. And so I had to write to get those, those feelings out. I had to write to process those feelings because you guys know in the military, you have, it's like mission, 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 right? So how, how often do you really have time to stop and process emotions or get in, in tune with your emotions? You don't, you don't. You just, step on the, you just step on those emotions with your combat boots and you keep charging forward with the mission. And that's what I did for 22 years. I got good at it too. I was like, Chief, give Chief a task. She'll knock it out, she'll get it done. But when life knocked me out, I had to figure out a way how to process those emotions and journaling it was it for me. And so then I transitioned and, and I reverted back to journaling. And then, like I said, those emotions really knocked me, knocked me on my butt and during transition. And I, I, that's when the idea came to share my story. That's when the idea really, where I really got serious about sharing, wanting to share my story, wanted to publish books and things like that. Because I felt like um, when I tr struggled through transition, I knew there had to be somebody else struggling. I had my husband, he was a great supporter. My family, they were great. Uh, even though they never served, they were still very supportive of me. Um, but I knew there were other people out there, other service members out there who didn't have that support system around them. And so I wanted to share the things that I learned in that process. And so that's, that's how I became a, a published author with my first, very first book. I self-published it. I know the cover looks crazy, but <laughs> that's it. A little short little book. And it talks about my transition. It talks about everything that I learned in that process and the tools that I instilled in myself to help me push through that period of time. And so the great thing was when I finally went to mental health, which is, I, just let me tell y'all, I was a military intelligence officer. So I had top secret clearance. So in the, and when I was in uniform, I was not going to, the, to see mental health at all because you would lose your whole career. <laughs> So I never, I'm not saying that I didn't need it, but I'm just saying that I never went to it until I retired out. And so when I went and got help through mental health services, they really helped me a lot. And they, they reassured me that the things that I was doing with journaling and writing um, were indeed what I needed to do to move forward in, my, in, my, in the struggle that I was dealing with in the transition. And so I share all of that to say, as you can see, like my story is layered, right? How many of y'all's story is just as layered as mine, right? Yeah, absolutely. We wear so many different hats. We're spouses, we're service members, we're mothers, we're daughters, we're friends, you know, we're sisters in arms. We have so many different hats that we wear. And I think sometimes as women, we forget, we forget that there's like some really good parts to our story that we forget to, to tell. That's the one thing that I really picked up on when I created Camouflage Sisters, which is a, a, my platform to help women veterans share their stories. And so with the first book, it came out in 2015. Um, <clears throat> this is it right here. It's subtitled, uh, Share Revealing Struggles of the Black Woman's Military Experience. But who, how many of y'all know, when I talk about transition or leadership or balancing it all or how my faith carried me through, all of us can relate to that. I only share it as an African-American woman because that's who I am. But this book relates to all of us because that's our story. But um, when I took that book around, um, you know, we, we hide well in, in society, right? <laughs> so I put up my banner, I put the book on the table and a lot of ladies would come up to me and they were shared, oh, I, I served too, I served too. I'm like, oh, thank you for your service. But you know what I realized? A lot of times when they shared their story, it was like the painful part of their story. Oh, girl, let me tell you, I was, I, I experienced a rape in basic training. And then when I got to my first assignment, you know, my supervisor, he just sexually harassed me like day after day. But like, there gotta be more to your story. Like, what was your MOS? Yeah. 
Were you an NCO or were you an officer? Maybe you were a warrant officer like me. Like, did you deploy? Do you still have soldiers who contact you and tell you how you impacted their life? What about your family? How did the military help your family? You know, like don't forget the good parts of your story. And so that's the main thing I really want you guys to take away um, from that. And so three, three ways we can tell our story as women veterans. Number one is, I know a lot of ladies raised their hands said they have their benefits. So I'm going to assume that most of you all are registered at your local VA medical center, right everybody? Very good. That is, I, I always, with my community, I always tell them that's the number one way for us as women veterans to share our stories, right? How many of y'all have a women's uh, clinic at your facility? You do? How many of you don't, don't? You don't, yeah, see? So if you know other women veterans, tell them to register at the local VA. How are they gonna make a women's clinic if they don't know you're there, right? I tell every woman I come in contact with, register, if you don't even use the services, register at the VA so that, they're no, so that they know you're in the area, when they have programs, when they offer new services, they know that we're here, they know what our needs are, and they know how to serve us. That's number one. Number two, I talked about journaling. How many people journal on a regular, regular basis? Yeah. Journaling is phenomenal. How many of y'all post positive things on social media on a regular basis? That's journaling, right? That's, it is, it is, it's journaling. It, it, it reaches a lot of people. It's, a lot of times when you post positive stuff, it's for you, right? Every time I post something positive, I'm, I'm talking to Lila first and everybody else is like, they, they just the added bonus if, if you get something out of my positive. What you, what you need to process to get to the point to share your story. So. With Camouflage Sisters, I have five books, I have four to five that we've uh, published. And it's a platform, like I said, for women veterans to share their story. Between our five books, we have 75 women who share their stories, right? And it's a specific way that I write, and I'm glad you said that. We all have a story. We all have layers to our story. We have so much that we can share to inspire and motivate the world. We do. I believe that wholeheartedly in my heart. But there is, there's a, you have to be at a certain point of healing to be able to effectively share that story so that you don't harm somebody, right? Like I said earlier, a lot of ladies came to me sharing that, that pain that they held from their military experience. I had pain too, like being a, a black woman in the military and military intelligence, my goodness, how white is that MOS? <laughs> I mean, really, like, really, exactly. So I'm always, I, 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 to fit in, it was a struggle sometimes. I had a big mouth. I had to talk louder and louder and louder until I got a whole bunch of dots on my chest and they were like, oh, hey, chief, welcome to the club. <laughs> yeah, I finally got here, right? But, but we all experience some type of pain in our service that um, we have to process. You're absolutely right. We have to process to get to a point where we can effectively tell that story so that we can help the next generation of women coming behind us. And so if you do have an idea of a book inside of you, if you do desire to publish, which I think we all should at some point write and share and publish our story because we're not in the history books. We're not gonna get there. So it's up to us to own our stories and to share our stories. And so um, we're gonna have the authors come up now and we're gonna talk a little bit more about publishing. You'll hear their stories. And um, <clears throat> and then just keep, keep on in mind as you move forward, you'll be able to connect with these ladies. Thank you all. Thank you, thank you. Yeah. My name is Harmony Oswald. I served for two years overseas in the U.S. Army 1st Infantry Division. I was a 46R, yes, go Army Hook. I was a 46R, which is a broadcast journalist. There were only about 42, I think, broadcast journalists in the whole Army at the time. So it was, um, it was really an awesome experience overseas. Um, my work went on to Armed Forces Network, for example. I was stationed in Würzburg, Germany and at the Public Affairs Office there. Um, the US Army, when I tell my story, I always, the first thing I tell people is that the US Army absolutely was one of the best choices that I ever made. Uh, it gave me leadership and confidence that I never had before. 
I always recommend that kind of military experience uh, that's really unique for people. And I recommend it to people that uh, really kind of otherwise maybe didn't get that in their lives. It can really impact and change your life in a positive way. So that's what it did for me. Um, so I'm always very grateful for the U.S. Army and I always, that's one of the reasons why I talk if I'm invited, you know, to tell my story because uh, I'm kind of paying it forward or giving it, you know, giving it back as far as I'm, I'm, my gratitude about that. So I grew up in a small town in Pennsylvania. When I was a little kid, I wanted to be a lawyer, but that really wasn't available to me. Um, my family wasn't, my parents uh, were not college educated really. Um, and I didn't know any lawyers. I had no lawyers, friends, anything like that. So it was in the US Army too that I was, you know, since I was stationed in Europe, I, I became, uh, I had a much broader worldview because of that. And it made me realize that I can be anything I want to be. It really gave me that confidence. Um, now something that happened to me actually, um, you know, you talk about the difficulty of transition. That's something that actually didn't happen to me because of my MOS was a really, a uh, good one to transition back into civilian work. I did broadcast journalism for about 10 years after that. Um, so that was, that was really helpful. But one thing that happened to me, you talk about the pain of your story. Um, so when I was, I, I was dual military actually at the time. Uh, and when we were overseas, I was pregnant with my first, my son, I have two kids. Um, and so we had to have a talk about, you know, you have to have a family care plan when you're over there. If both of you are in the military and you both get deployed, who's taking care of your kid, right? And we didn't have a family care plan. So we were overseas, you know, what are, we're going to be new parents. So what are we gonna do about that? And at the time, I remember having this difficult conversation and, um, you know, looking back, I was so young at the time too, but anyway, I really, I guess, was kind of career focused at the time. I really enjoyed the Army, as I'm telling you. I really liked, I felt very grateful about my MOS. I felt like it was a privilege to be an overseas journalist. And my husband at the time uh, was in the infantry. And I talked to him about how I really thought that it would be best for me to stay in the army uh, because, you know, again, we did not have a family care plan. Um, and I asked for him, and I was like 22 years old at this time, so, and I'm at now 42, right? But so I look back and I was asking him to get out of the infantry and allow me to continue with my career that I really enjoyed. But at the time, through, when we had that conversation, he told me that, you know, due to kind of gender roles and pressure for, for males as well, uh, he didn't really feel comfortable with that. And we're still friends, by the way. So. <laughs> so, we're still friends. Yes, we absolutely are. Um, and, but anyway, so uh, that was, and we went through that difficulty too, where, you know, of deployment, you're, you're together for like a month during two years or something, you know, it's yeah. really a difficult thing for family. So kudos to you, your story, how you stayed together, but we actually didn't. Um, so anyway, so when I was about 24 years old, I kind of woke up one day and I was a divorced single mother of two babies pretty much, right? So, wow, that's something, you know, to process and really overcome in your life. So, um, so it was that, at that point in my life when I really realized that I wanted to help empower young women like myself, who I really didn't receive any kind of guidance in my life growing up that you really need to kind of become uh, independence both emotionally financially and so forth before you have a family yes. I didn't realize that so um, anyway fast forward a few years I met my amazing husband uh, Rick we actually yesterday celebrated our 16th anniversary uh, <laughs> yeah. um, so he through the years of course he helped you know raise our kids together 
Um, and um, he really encouraged me to go back to school. So at that time, I was actually, so with my background with broadcast journalism, I thought one way to advance and empower young women would be, perhaps I could host some kind of show to advance women, young women, right? Mm -hmm. So I was going to kind of auditions, actually. I ended up one time, I, was, I did an audition at MTV in Manhattan, for example, trying to pitch this, this hosting a show, right? But they didn't really like my idea that much. It was, it was kind of too good. Uh, too, you know what I mean? It was too yeah. much social justice type of thing. But, um, too much empowerment of women. Yeah, yeah it, it just wasn't the right thing at the time. But it was not meant to be at that time. So anyway, um, my husband um, and also the U.S. Army, so those two things, um, because of the, again, the Army gave me that those, the leadership skills, and I realized that I can do and become anything that I want to be. So I went back to school at age 32. I went straight through for seven years to become a lawyer. Oh. And I, <laughs> so, yes, so I am a member of the California Bar. Wow. Um, and I, um, I currently am actually a uh, legal tech CEO. We launched a new company that I'm the founder and CEO of Legal Lucy, it's called. Oh, thank, you. Um, <laughs> thank you so much. But uh, so in the last um, couple of years, I published a book and this book was highly, you know, impacted by my experience in the military, which is why it's called Parism Strong Warrior Woman. It is a leadership book for, for women. Um, one of the reasons, it's so funny you talk about with your book, you have this book inside of you. That's, so, that's exactly what my life was like. Um, and it took me not very long at all. It was actually shortly after I, you know, I took the California bar to become a licensed attorney. Um, and it, it was, took me a very short time to write this book, actually. It was just right inside of me, right? It just poured it right out. But anyway, I, I just one thing I want to mention, too, about this book is that throughout my life, one of my favorite authors was Paulo Coelho, uh, yes. who write, he wrote The Alchemist. Alchemist. And one of my favorite books was called Warrior of the Light. And this is an amazing book. I recommend it. And the way the book works is that you can just open the book and read one page. Okay, like each page is separate. So it's kind of each an empowering page in the book. So, but the one thing I didn't like about the book is that the pronoun he was used the whole time throughout the book. So it was like the warrior, he, 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 right? <laughs> I never liked it. It just, yeah. I, I love the book too, yeah. right? So I thought we need to have a female warrior book. Yeah. So guess what, here it is. <laughs> here is that book. Um, it's kind of a collection of what has made me a leader through the years. Um, and it has kind of an army, you know, a soldier type spin to it. Um, because again, it's really made me who I am. So thank, thank you. you for listening. <laughs> so I love, this is my first time here on Harmony Story, but uh, I mean, the, my takeaway and probably yours is that you can, we can always recreate ourselves she went back to school and became a lawyer at 32. Like, high five. That is yeah, so I mean, mad. That's, right. Right. <laughs> I mean, that's so cool. Yourself. You can always yeah. recreate yeah. yourself. So never, true. ever, ever, ever think that you're stuck doing one thing. Exactly. All right. Gracias. Okay. So let's see. I will. Start with your military background. I will do it. I will do it. Start with your military background. Yeah. Yeah, so I'll, I'll say it this way. I This is how I introduced myself in the previous session. I am Graciela Tiscareño Sato, daughter of Mexican immigrants, who found herself in high school in the counselor's office saying, how do people like me go to college? Because everybody that I know that has nicer houses and cars and goes to Austria for the summer, they all went to college. So how do I, with immigrant parents, go to college? And so my high school counselor's husband was an Air Force major. So this is a random little moment here. But my counselor said, come to my house for dinner. My husband will tell you what he did. So I tell you that story because everything I do that I'm about to tell you is all about mentoring little kids, teenagers, and college students who have no idea. No idea. And it's too random that I learned about the Air Force ROTC scholarship from my high school counselor's husband. That's just random. 
So he mentored me, Major Burgess. He took me through the whole process. I ended up at Berkeley with an Air Force ROTC scholarship, and that's where my story starts. Very good. So from Colorado, sight and scene to Berkeley, uh, four-year scholarship and uniform, and I don't know what I'm doing, but I'm just trying this out for a year, and then I loved it. I loved all the leadership. I loved the physical fitness. I loved all of it. Halfway through, they took us to Williams Air Force Base, and I found myself in a T-37 with Captain Dolly Delisa, a female pilot, who lets me fly this plane, and we're doing barrel rolls and aileron rolls, and then when we're landing, I'm just a cool joyride, right? And she's like, well, you know, you can go back and ask them, tell them that you wanna fly. And I'm like, oh, I have a college scholarship, and I'm a civil engineering, and, and she's like, no, just tell them you wanna fly, because this is the time that you can get selected, and that's what happened, again, I'm open to mentoring, I'm listening to tips, right? So I, I listened to her, I went back and I said, I'd like to fly, what do I do? So I went through all the paperwork and then I got selected for undergraduate navigator slot to go after commissioning. So I got commissioned at top of the Campanile in Berkeley. My immigrant parents, each of them putting a butter bar on me. It's a photo that if you go to LinkedIn, you'll see one of my articles, it's my pride and joy. Happy, happy moment. And then I went down the road to flight training for a year. And then from there, I got a KC-135 assignment the man who pinned my wings on me that day at flight school is my husband of 27 years. We just celebrated 27 years. And I met him in the Cal Marching Band playing trombone. And so we just, we got stationed up at Fairchild. I've been to 27 countries, five continents, 30, I don't know, 3,100 hours in the air or something like that. Got an air medal on my first deployment. So I loved that adventure so much that I went straight from you know, from Air Force, I transitioned straight into global marketing management for a telecommunications company. So, airplane to global marketing. Mm -hmm. I had a master's degree I finished while I was in on active duty, but I have to tell you this: I do not let people tell you that you have to do some career. Yours was a smooth transition. Mm -hmm. I literally was told by all these recruiters, "No way are you going to find a job doing global marketing for a tech company." You have no experience. I'm like, dude, I fly airplanes. Like, I can learn anything, right? So do not let them tell you what you can't do. And so I came back once I got my job offer. I told him all the details because he wasn't getting any of it because I did it myself, right? And then after 10 years working in telecommunications, I also worked in solar photovoltaics. I worked for German companies, Israeli companies. I've always stayed in a global profession because I thank you, Air Force, for exposing me to the world. And then uh, when the layoffs happened in 2000. Nine, I was already doing keynote speaking and writing and you know, traveling to conferences and speaking about technology and use cases and then in the business realm. But then I decided, you know what? That's what I love. I love writing, I love creating, and I love sharing stories and speaking, but not my story. I was always looking at, oh, let's, let's look at their good stuff, right? It took a long time to decide to tell my story. And it wasn't until I had my first child who just turned 18 25 weeks, one pound, two ounces, blind, hearing impaired, epileptic, that's my first child. She just turned 18, and then I had two others. But I founded a company after the layoffs happened, Gracefully Global Group, it's an educational publishing and marketing communications company, because I realized I've got stories to tell, and I didn't do my story first, I told the stories of Latinos, entrepreneurs, I've got other books that I published, but then my little boy, when he was four, saw me in my uniform one day before Veterans Day and he started pulling the patches off and asking what they were. And the first time he'd ever seen me in uniform, it was night before Veterans Day. As he leaves the room, he says, I love you, and he says, Captain Mama. Aww. Captain Mama. So my little boy invented this character, became the first book, Good Night, Captain Mama. But you know what? My first language was Espanol. So these are the first ever bilingual children's books about women serving in the military. My company is creating the genre. Thank you. And then La Sorpresa de Capitan Mama, Captain Mama's Surprise. We're taking the story out to the jet. We meet the entire crew, which is three women and a guy. And so there's gender empowerment. And the best story I'll tell you is the very first assembly I ever did was in Spanish for Veterans Day in San Leandro. I live in the Bay Area. And the little girl in the front row, as they were leaving, she stopped in her tracks. All the kindergartners ran into her. And she had something to say. She pulled my sleeve and she said, Capitana Mama, yo también quiero volar aviones como tú. Oh. Which means, Captain Mama, I want to fly the airplanes like you. Oh. And that is why I write. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
and it every time. And so what I love about her story and, and the, the company that she's created is she found a niche market and she is killing it. So that's why I, I that's why I tell women veterans, if you are in business, if you have an idea, entrepreneur journey, tell your veteran story. I met, I went to Be Wise. How many of you guys know about Be Wise? I went to Be Wise and there were a lot of entrepreneurs in the room. One lady, she was a, a nurse for yacht owners, like people who own yachts, they got money. Like she was a private nurse for them. She'd go on their yachts and she would be that first day, first uh, first responder on the yacht. Yeah. And she was like, well, how do I get more business? How do I, uh, you know, spread, grow my business this, that, and the other? And I just, I just asked a random question. And I was like, have you told anybody you're a woman veteran? She's like, no, I, you know. <laughs> what? <laughs> I said, well, are you kidding me? Did you deploy? Like a nurse, a woman veteran, first off, who deployed to combat and experienced some combat experience as a nurse? Like, how bad? That's going to be a cool conversation on it. Yeah, because they don't, they don't get that. You know what I mean? So don't forget to tell your story in whatever it is you choose to do. I love the fact that she created a company centered around her story, but she yeah. serves an uh, unserved uh, community. And, well, I just, and it's very important too, what you're saying is like, you can't survive on book sales. Please understand oh, you cannot survive on book wait, sales. We I mean, like, right? I mean, like I, I created downloadable classroom content so you yes. can bring my story into the classroom. It's called a virtual author visit. I'm gonna hand out flyers. And I get paid to do keynote speaking all yeah. over the country. Yeah. I go to teacher conferences. I go to universities. So it is about the need to hear our stories and the people are out there. And yeah, you have to tell your story and you have to market what you're doing. Mm -hmm. But I am constantly surprised by the invitations that I get. Yes. Like we need you to come to the University of Wisconsin Technical College to talk about the intersectionality of being a Latina and a veteran and a woman and the, the disabled community because my kids. Intersectionality, we're all that, yes. right? Yes. But And it's a conversation. And so understand that when you tell your story, it opens up yes. the doors to things you cannot even begin to imagine. Okay. Right? How many of you guys volunteer at your local schools for Veterans Day to go speak? Do it so, now, yes. yes. If, you, if you are not doing that, please find an opportunity to do yes. that. Veterans Day, because you, you know what they get on Veterans Day, right? They don't get us, they get the old white dude and the, you know, y'all know, I mean, not to be, you know, sorry, not to be, but, but they're, they're, the military is a diverse community and they, and they need to see us, they need to see us. So if you're not volunteering, just go to your a local school, elementary, middle school, high school, and just say, hey, what do you got planned for Veterans Day? Or do you need veterans to volunteer in the lunchroom? Or do you, have, do you need veterans to come and speak? What do you need? I'm a veteran. And so let them know you're there and you're there to serve. So there are so many opportunities for us to share our stories. Okay. Hi, hi, hi. Lovely stories. I love it. Um, my name is Lori Sales and I'm from Chicago, from the projects. Grew up with brothers older than me and I was the only girl in my house. Um, I'm from Chicago. I'm saying that again because I'm, I'm someone that gets to hustle. Uh, I, I'm legal and illegal. <laughs> so nonetheless, I was living my life uh, at a model profession during high school. Um, so I had means of making money. Going off to college wasn't a, a mindset at all. You know, I was making good money. I made more money than my dad in high school because of the modeling I was doing. However, I was living a lifestyle also of illegally distributing. Mm -hmm. So I had even more money, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, some guys I knew, both two guys uh, that uh, were both knew me from dating, hanging out. One guy actually asked me to marry Both of them actually asked me to marry him. <laughs> Re-engaged, different times, but both of them joined the Marine Corps. Mm. And so um, I just knew I needed to change my life. I looked in the mirror one day and I didn't like myself. And I told myself that. I do not like you. Mm. You know, I mean, I, some nights were blurry. I do remember this. I mean, I was just getting it in. I was being a typical urban city girl and all that comes with that. And so um, they both told me, Lori, join the Marine Corps. I'm like, they got women in the Marine Corps? Now this is 1982. I'm 21 years old, and I made a decision to join the United States Marine Corps. I did not tell anyone, because the few people I did tell, girl, you know you ain't gonna let nobody tell you what to do. You, I don't even know why you're trying to do that's, that's a joke. You don't even listen to your parents. Girl, please. I mean, so listen, and, and when you got your own money in your pocket, guess what? You, you, I was grown long before 21. I do what I want to do when I want to do it. My parents trusted me on that. I didn't have to ask for money to go to the movies. I had money in my pocket. I'm going to the movies, Mom. Okay, I'll be back. Bye. 
So that was the law in the house, right? So nonetheless, I joined, and I wasn't quite sure either, right? Either that I would make it through, but I did. I made it through. And uh, of course, the Marine Corps of all branches, uh, uh, is, is, you all know it, just the truth is the truth. It is the roughest and the toughest. Um, I, happen, I, I am a woman, and I happen to be African American, and there are definitely some differences in that, right? Uh, the challenges of getting through. Nonetheless, I made it through. I served 10 years from 1982 to 1992. When I got out of the Marine Corps, though, there was no internet, there was no nothing. You were still looking at the newspaper for jobs. Uh, I made it to the level of E6 during uh, the time of um, Desert Storm. I was a reservist, active duty reservist. So I was going to do that thing every what, um, once a month and every two weeks, right, for three years. But no one respected that in that era. Me serving in the military, I, I mean, you just served in the military. So when I went out looking for work in the Washington DC metropolitan area, they gave me jobs as a receptionist. Now you hear my voice, I'm a little raspy, you know. Um, I speak a lot, so I'm raspier than probably normal, but I'm, I'm raspy. So I had to be taught how to lighten the voice up. <laughs> Good morning, ABC company, how can I help you? You know, so I had to become, because this girl that was a Marine, I went to the head for a long time. In my business attire, I'm going to the head. And one day this lady pulled me, she said, when you say that head, are you like referring to the bathroom? <laughs> Where are you going? I'm thinking, yeah, 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 yeah. Well, just say you're going to the bathroom. I'm like, but you know, I don't know when I stop saying I'm going to the head. And you have the communication of lingo that you learn from serving. And anybody that re-enlists, that's my thing. If you do four and out, that's a little different of a better. But when you re-enlist and heaven forbid, retire, you really have adapted to this whole culture. So I'm a little rough around the edges. I was a tomboy, you know, again, the only girl of brothers. You know, so I mean, I'm a little rough around the edges. And so there was this whole transition. My communication skills was low. I can communicate extremely well to make sure you do exactly yes. what I tell you. Yes. <laughs> With four letter words. <laughs> and it ain't gonna last long. But you know exactly what I want you to do when I walk away. Right? So nonetheless, I had to learn how to communicate. I had to learn how to buy in, get buy in from people. I had to learn how to be courteous. I mean, I had to learn a whole lot of stuff because I decided not to be a police officer, not to go to corrections, uh, um, um, but yet be a businesswoman. I wanted to put a suit on. I wanted to come out that uniform, right? So nonetheless, I go through being a receptionist to an admin assistant to um, an operations manager, like office manager, but operations to becoming an executive assistant, which I've stayed in that space for a very long time as an executive assistant supporting president CEOs. And then I finally got positioned as a project manager working inside the federal government space. So minded now, I've already done 10 years in the Marine Corps. So leadership is in. When I was having all these little small jobs, I was always managing people. Well, you need to manage the reception, so you need to manage the clerk, because my leadership skills were there. And so instead of just you being who you are, can you help these other people? My first position that I accepted and I was totally excited about, $17,000 a year. Now, that wasn't no money in 1992. <laughs> Let's be clear. Yeah. But I was just so excited to be offered a job, and it was as a receptionist. Well, today I'm the president and CEO of a multi-million dollar company. Woo! I do government contracting. And so that, that field is, my name is Lori Sales. I'm President and CEO of Civility Management Solutions. We do professional consulting services, program, project, financial grants management, acquisition, administrative support, and conference and logistics. How can I serve you? That's my, my normal appeal, my spiel. But I know it's how we had to start today. So uh, we're working inside Department of Homeland Security, Department of Transportation, the Air Force. I'm still trying to get in the Marine Corps. Um, I've done some work as well with the Army. We do some human capital training. So we have not only federal government contracts, we have some state and local contracts in Maryland, as well as uh, some commercial work that we're doing. So, you know, people see me now and they just go, wow, you know. And at the same time, I've had this really wild life. So the book came out of me from this to that. And I started to writing in, I started writing a couple years ago, which is basically my bio. Because I mean, I went from, again, you know, I've always been an entrepreneur. I've landed with you all in knowing I'm an entrepreneur. I've always been an entrepreneur. So I'm legal, so I'm illegal. So I mean, <laughs> yeah, I'm just being, I keep it real. Because I mean, thank God, I got a top secret clearance today. So I didn't clean up a whole lot of stuff. Hey, hey, hey. So I've cleaned up a whole lot. But yet at the same time, um, 
with getting through those steps, you know, from this to that. I mean, I modeled profession down joining the Marine Corps. That was a you know, big ditch to that. And so I've had a lot of those incidents. I lived a lesbian lifestyle. I was a hardcore dyke. I performed on stage as, as, a, as a, a crossover dresser. You know, like you all have drag queens. Everybody in here been on shows? You know, where there's Dolly Parton. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay, well, I was Will Smith. I was Luther Vandross. <laughs> My books show some of the pictures. Yeah, I mean, I did a lot of characters. I mean, professionally, I was doing that. So I had a lot of this for that. And then I had a domestic violence issue. Once my business started making millions, my husband decided to charge me with second degree assault. He tried to, uh, decided to charge me with theft. And all this was an effort to steal the company from me and to have me in prison for seven years. Uh -huh. So for this, for that, became a book to push to the side. Because my that is not, I'm married happily to a man, left the lifestyle, and la la la. I had to come up with another book. It's called As My Leaders Go, So Do I. So I've been very fortunate to be mentored up in my civilian lifestyle more than anything in the Marine Corps. We didn't call it mentoring anyway. And um, at this recent crisis that I just went through pushed this book out of me to say, you know, I'm always trying to be better. I'm always trying to improve. But how do you receive information and how do you end up being responsible for it? And so we all are responsible for our own responsibility. We're held responsible for what we say and what we do. And so despite the fact that he was being so awfully terrible, because all these were fraudulent lies that I viciously and savagely beat him. Let me be clear. I didn't do anything to this man. I had to take the high road. And so I walked through the process. I didn't kill him, because Lord knows I want to. I, I mean, I wanted to hurt him. I studied boxing. I, I'm a Marine for real. I mean, I can do a little something, something. You know what I'm saying? But I'm going to do it to protect myself, not to cause harm. So in the end, this book was put out, uh, and actually in the end, it, it, it happened very quickly that this book ended up being published because I was uh, presenting a God's Glamorous Girl. I'm also an advocate for all the women in here that are interested in being business owners. When they're talking about women, minorities, and services for veterans, I've been on the Hill three times now speaking on our behalf, talking about the things they need to do for us specifically to make sure that we get capital that we need to make sure that veterans get this, uh, the work available to them because that's not a socially economic disadvantaged business that you have, you are an earned status business when you are a veteran that's a business owner. That's Positivity. So um, I served 10 years in the United States Army. The Army was good to me. I am a soldier for life. And I say that specifically because my transition, um, at my, I was a career soldier. Like I wanted to be Sergeant Major of the Army. I had goals to, uh, to, to career base, uh, retire out of the military. But my priorities uh, changed after different experience that I faced serving in the military. And I had to make a tough decision. I had to make a decision on that next chapter, that transition, or that continue in my boots journey, and I ended up uh, transitioning out. I actually met Lila um, during that transition, right before I finally uh, made the decision, and I was bawling at her table. Um, no, no clue as to how I was going to go forward. And when I say I'm a soldier for life, it's because when I have that conversation, I don't know how to do anything else. I don't see it beyond just the army. Like, it's not going to leave me. There's no way I can drop it and be Ashley outside of the military. I am somebody be beyond the military. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying this military can't be thrown away. Mm -hmm. This experience of being in the military could not be thrown away. And that transition was that conversation with myself. I am just this. I am just that. No, those two come together in a perfectly beautiful package that I present to people now as a um, 
author, so I am excited to be here today. I'm a five-time um, self-published author. Uh, well, one is, or two of them, three of them are self-published, two of them are in, in anthologies. So I brought this packet because I would have books in my arms like this. And um, I didn't bring one that's not on here because I just published one this year, 21 Days of Positive Speaking, but I am a positive life influencer and it, and it comes by trade like it's in me like i was saying with i'm a soldier for life i'm ashley marie those gifts come together and you don't have to put one aside to have the other they come together and so um that's my journey to become an author i've been writing my whole life i'm a journaling uh guru like as far as like i find a receipt i find a sticky note like i have all these different thoughts i'm writing it down and then i now I collect them and I write it in an actual spiral at the end of the day. But before I had a pile of junk written, scribble scrabble everywhere that I had to compile one day when I started writing. And most of my books come from all of those scribble scrabbles of thoughts, ideas, experiences that I face. So for that in, in general, you don't have to sit down and write a book. You literally let those thoughts out of your mind to create a story that somebody else needs. Yes. What yeah. I was saying about the, the two intermingling together, it, I, it wasn't until I joined Lila and Camouflage Sisters, I'm administrative executive assistant for um, Camouflage Sisters now, um, sharing those stories it was real. And having those stories attached to the ladies that come to me and be like, you know what, I needed somebody like you today. Or it gives me a, a purpose of why I'm here. Yeah. Don't, don't be afraid to share those stories. <laughs> I was a young, shy girl, uh, you know, just really insecure of myself. And then making it through basic training, I was like, oh, snap, I'm, I'm pretty strong. Like, I passed that PT test. That was pretty cool. And then to survive a 22-year active duty career and, and everything that that came with, it really bolsters something inside of me. So don't, I don't care if you did three years or 33 years, don't, don't dismiss your military story. And that's what Ashley encompasses that and everything that she does. Um, and then all the ladies share, you know, like um, things that they, challenges that they face in life and how that birthed something positive out of that. And so are there any questions from the audience that you want, anybody want to ask any questions at all? Um, what's your first name that was broadcast journalist? My name is Harmony. Harmony? Yes, Harmony Oswald. I'm the founder and CEO of Legal Lucy. Is everybody's book in the bookstore out? Yes. yes. So all of the books are available in the bookstore um, out here in the foyer. So you can get your books. We're here to sign books for you. All the books are available. So please, if Mine you come with patches too for your yeah. kids, if you purchase the books, track us down and we'll sign them for you. With yeah. my books, you get a cute little camouflage bag to go with your I love with it. your book. Yes, ma'am. Um, when, when you got out of the military, you started coming with other women veterans. What was the wall that came up when you asked them point blank, like you have and I have, um, did you ever tell them that you were a female veteran? And what was their answer? I started to do that once I actually began to investigate being a business owner because then I knew I had value. Yeah. Before that, again, I served 82 to 92. You know, I know I don't look this. I'm 58, <laughs> I'm 58 years old. Yes, uh, but at the same time, there was there was no discussions about being there. Was no value to it. So what was it was without saying it out loud. Unfortunately, due to all the wars we've had, that's changed. So now, yes, I'm not only an advocate, but I'm always constantly talking about the importance of letting people know that you served. Right? Yes. But it, it, so you all probably comfortably have been doing it because they've gotten out recently. It's a way of life. But for me, I had to fight my way into it because no one ever cared about it. So is, there, is your question more like what other yeah, people's yeah, well, reactions? When it came up to you, um, like, I, I work for, I was with National Guard, Military Postal Service Agency, Camp Mabry, Texas National Guard. And when my female veterans would go out, I said, let them know that you're a veteran. Well, you know, when they get out of the military and I go to the schools, it's like, you did tell me you were a veteran that you're except for these falling benefits, they're going, uh, no, I says, what happened when you got out? And it's like, well, my daddy wanted me to come back home and, and he wanted me to go ahead and marry this guy and I had to get back in the church. But the families never discussed, they were very proud of their sons being veterans, but I found that families would not discuss their daughters yeah, yeah. as our, veterans. Our we need to pull it out. Women at 
it's our responsibility as other women veterans to show them the value of their service. That's that's one thing I say. Like one of the word, the models that I use with Camouflage Sisters, uh, we value your voice while we honor your service. You yes. you're a woman veteran. Don't ever it's, it's still, minimize that. It's still a very patriarchal society. Can yeah. we just say it? it? It just is, right? And there's some families that are super progressive. I just finished reading a book called Danger Close by Amber yes. Smith, who flew Kiowa helicopters. Yeah. It's an incredible book. All three of her sisters, well, she and her siblings, all three of these young women are aviators in the Army, Army Air Force. Her family is so proud of the three, but that's unusual, right? There's still this very, but you know what? Women are 28% of the Air Force. And right, right. Yes. You, got, you have that block with the Hispanic culture for us to, for us to come out, us to pull them out. We have to be the ones. I was the only one, I'm the oldest of six kids, and I was the only one that served. My parents didn't serve, my siblings never served. But when I retired, I bought everybody the four knobs. They sat in the front row during my retirement <laughs> ceremony. I thank them. You know, I did that. My dad was so proud. My mom was there crying. My son that I had at 15, he was there. You know, and so you, we have to. Drill home, like she said, yeah. drill home the value yeah. of your service. Well, and be seen. Right. Because if you're not seen, if, if, if you scare young women into talking about their service or you tell them they shouldn't or you dissuade them, and if they believe you, then that's one more person that isn't seen and then the whole thing can continue to be. Versus if we stand up proudly yeah. and show ourselves, then there's more millions of people who understand and accept that women are veterans, Latinas are veterans, mothers are veterans. Yeah, yeah. That's, those are my messages, right? How but if many, we come one down here. One. How many exactly. still believe the military is a great option for young ladies? All the time. Absolutely. Yep. We got to tell these stories, you guys. We got to tell. We, it, and and the, story is, the story includes that I serve too. I'm a woman veteran. 